So Tim's going to be sharing with us the Murphy administration's vision and plan for how we recapture our status as the innovation state here in the state of New Jersey, which is, we all talk about this all day, the vision of NJBIA. We say, Tim, when we wake up every day at BIA and we talk about creating jobs here in the state of New Jersey and a workforce to fill those jobs, we say it is with the ultimate vision of seeing New Jersey reclaim its stature as the, as the innovation state. Why is innovation important and so important to New Jersey? Sure. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. and Great to be with you, Michelle, and great to be with everyone here. It's uh, a, a bit, uh, it's quite a bit humbling and uh, candidly a little intimidating to follow four elected leaders like that. Um, but uh, it's an honor to be here. Great to be with you all. Uh, look, innovation has, you know, we, we didn't make this up, and, and uh, innovation is the lifeblood of any successful growing economy, and it's always been the calling card of New Jersey's economy. You know, from, from the 19th century on through, you know, the recent past, New Jersey was one of, if not the preeminent engines of innovation that fueled the American century and fueled the global economy uh, through the, you know, the, the research and discovery that was happening uh, and research and development that was happening in, in corporate labs and academic labs uh, all throughout the state. And the, the, the unfortunate reality is that for a whole bunch of reasons, and a lot of them were discussed in the previous panel, um, New Jersey's lost some of that edge compared to places like Northern California and Massachusetts and New York City and a handful of other places uh, that, that have really upped their game with regard to innovation and the innovation economy. Um, you know, the, the, the reality or the data um, <clears throat> is, is pretty crystal clear on this, that most of the job creation that happens in America, forget about whether it locates in which political subdivision or whatnot, but just the, the, the growth that happens in, in, in the American economy happens when small companies scale and get bigger. And it's when small companies become mid-sized companies, mid-sized companies become large companies. And you know, New Jersey has as enviable a roster of Fortune 500 companies as anybody in the world at 20 or 21. Uh, Fortune 500 companies that call New Jersey home, and that's great. Uh, 12 of the top 20 pharma companies call New Jersey home. We have substantial presence here. Dean, did I get that right? Okay. <laughs> 13 of the 20 manu of the medical device companies. Very good. Dean taught me well. Um, uh, call New Jersey home, and that's great. The reality is most of those companies have been large for a really long time. I and mean, that's great, that's not a knock on them, that's a, that, the, God bless. Um, but they've not been adding jobs by the thousands and the tens of thousands for several decades. Right. We've not now seen- Now we stagnated, right. Mm -hmm. it's not, they're doing great, they're doing fine, and I'd like to be a shareholder in them, they're, they're doing great. Um, but they're, they're, they're not adding the kind of right. jobs globally or in New Jersey uh, that they were when they were in their, mass, you know, in, their, in their growthiest parts of their life cycle. We need to have more of the entrepreneurial, young, early stage companies in both our traditional strengths like life sciences and technology, but also in new er industries like clean energy uh, and digital media and other areas where you're going to see you know, companies that are going to join the Fortune 500 or the Fortune 1000 or become you know, big, large scale employers grow up from, you know, the, the, you know, sprout from the garden of the garden state, if you will. I just kind of came up with that. Not bad. Um, <laughs> Take note. He's going to want to use that again. Yeah, but I'm going to pen, I'm gonna <laughs> trademark that. Um, because that's, that's where you get that. It's, that's both the most, that's the, it, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about Amazon in the last two years for lots of reasons. It's much cheaper in any context to have an Amazon grow up and, and, and start in your state or in your city than it is to be trying to get them to move or expand or, or grow here. You still got to do that. I'm not saying you don't do that. But you, the more you know, young, early stage companies you can get to go from 5, 10, 20 people to 100 to 1,000 to 10,000 people, that's, that's the magic. Uh, that's, that's, the, that's the 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 rocket fuel for the innovation, so, for, for, the, for the economy overall. So in the state of New Jersey then, what, what is it that we need to do to catalyze that? I mean, we heard the example of you know, Philly being attractive, et cetera, for, mm -hmm. for the next generation worker. How do we catalyze that here? Yeah, it, it takes a comprehensive approach, and that's one of the reasons that, that, that both the EDA and across the Murphy administration, the governor has us so focused on, on taking a comprehensive approach to economic development. Um, we'll t I'll get to incentives in a moment, because obviously that's a topic of great interest, and incentives have a role to play and have to be, have to be a tool in the toolkit. Um, but we have to be thinking much more broadly about the, the competitive factors that go into a company making a decision, a person making a decision about where they want to live, and a company deciding where they want to be. Um, you know, the two, um, the two topics that come up first and second in some order in virtually every conversation we have with a company, uh, whether they're in New Jersey and thinking about their future or outside New Jersey also thinking about their future, it's talent and infrastructure. Sure. The good news is on the talent side, we're doing incredibly well. We've got a great hand of cards to play. We have the number one public school system in America. We, that's recently up from number two. I get in trouble if I don't mention that within the first 10 minutes of speaking publicly. The governor has me run laps after practice if I don't mention that every time I speak. Um, because it's really important. It's an incredibly important competitive advantage. Um, and you know, on the infrastructure side of the equation, obviously challenges at places like transit notwithstanding, 
in the current period, you know, having the road and rail and bridge and tunnel infrastructure that we do located where we are with the uh, in, in the middle of the Northeast Carter, those are incredibly strong assets. Um, so maximizing those, you know, continuing to invest in those things, finding the resources to invest on, on, on the education of both the primary, and secondary, and post-secondary side, and on things like infrastructure and water and all the things that make for great quality of life and make the economy work day to day are really important. But then specifically around innovation, I think there's sort of three dimensions you want to think about a strategy for how to tackle uh, or how to sort of um, focus on growing your innovation economy. You know, it's talent, capital, and real estate. Um, and those three things contribute to what a lot of people would call sort of the innovation ecosystem. And there's some other things that sort of so softer things that come around that. Talent, again, we're, we're doing well, but we need to do better. So we need to retain more of our students. We need to retain, we need to create more STEM grads. We need to get more uh, uh, and, you know, do exactly what uh, folks like uh, Commissioner Saro Angelo are doing at the Labor Department around more apprenticeship, getting more young people into uh, paths to careers, uh, both in the innovation economy and in the more traditional parts of the economy. Those are really important and those are really uh, vital things. Things like computer science for all in the public school system, deeply important to the innovation economy. Not going to make a difference tomorrow. But building for the but future. But building for that Absolutely. talent pipeline for the sure. future is incredibly important. Yeah. Um, and then things like you know the STEM loan forgiveness program that, that are trying to retain more talent. And I'll come back to talent again in, in a moment. And then there's things like capital and real estate. The innovation economy needs places to take root. The innovation economy, at least in, in the 21st century, in 2019, wants, generally speaking, wants to be in places that are a little bit more urban, a little bit more walkable, a little bit more mixed use, a little bit more dynamic than the way New Jersey's economy set itself up in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And so there's a transition to be had there around focusing on our cities in particular and thinking about collaborative co-working spaces, thinking about how we're going to use office space differently. I had a conversation yesterday, with, or two days ago, with a great group of, of real estate developers thinking about how are we going to reorient how we think about Class A office space, because first of all, not lots of young companies can't quite afford Class A office space, don't really want Class A office space. They're okay with a little bit of grit. They're okay with a little bit of um, uh, sort of a homespun feel to their office space while they're young. Um, and they don't want a five-year credit lease. They don't want a 10-year credit lease because five years from now, if they're, if they're where they are now, something's gone wrong. They're either likely to have completely blown up or blown up in the good way and are much bigger. And so we've got to be thinking about how we're using real estate differently. And so that means... Um, making big investments in our cities around transit-oriented development, not just our cities, or places that are served by transit, uh, in transit-oriented development, building more mixed-use apartments and, and condos and, and townhomes right next to retail, right next to commercial office space so that it's more, there's a, a higher vibrancy factor. Um, and then it's on the capital, uh, the capital side of the equation. Um, one of the things that's so important to the governor's economic development plan and the, and the incentives bill that's uh, being worked on is this Innovation Evergreen Fund, uh, which is around venture capital. Venture capital is the rocket fuel of the, of the innovation economy. And it's not the only factor. If your only strategy is grow, grow, the, grow venture capital, you're not going to succeed because it, it has to be partnered with a holistic strategy, again, around talent, around real estate, around infrastructure. Uh, but New Jersey fell from 5th to 15th the amount of venture capital being invested in, in the state from 2007 to 2017. 5th to 15th. And once you fall in the top 10 in state rankings around the economy, you're with a group you don't want to be compared with. Um, and there's lots of reasons why that's true. There's not enough venture because there's not enough deal flow. There's not enough deal flow because there's not enough venture. And it's a, it's a cycle. Uh, but one of the things we've thought about a lot, and the gov I think is one of the most bold proposals in the governor's uh, incentive uh, proposal, is this Innovation Evergreen Fund, which would use tax credits, uh, but use them in, a, in an innovative way to partner big companies with small companies. I think Leader Greenwald was talking about this uh, and appreciate his, his comments on that. Um, how do you partner and, 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 and tie together the destinies of the of the big companies and small companies, because it, it, be uh, it wouldn't be a surprising thought if you think, well, the big companies and the small companies have different strategies. Why, the, why do they want to help each other? And the reality is the big companies desperately need the innovation that is happening at small, riskier, earlier stage companies. And the small companies want to be bought by the big companies. And they want the talent to be able to go back and forth between those two companies. And some people like working for big Fortune 500 companies. Some people like working 10 people in a keg in, in their jeans and, right. a, and a sweatshirt. The, the different strokes for different folks. I'm a suit and tie person, apparently. Um, that's just different. You know, they, they want, but they want to be located near each other. And they want to, be, uh, they want to have that, that symbiosis. So we would, the Evergreen Fund, if the legislature and the governor can come to an agreement uh, on how to, how to actually operationalize this, would uh, allow the EDA to auction tax credits 
to big, uh, to you know, New Jersey corporate taxpayers, and they'd bid on two factors. One, what is the price they're willing to pay for that tax credit? So yeah, they presumably get a a little bit of a discount on their taxes, but two, what are they willing to do for the innovation ecosystem in terms of care and feeding? That could be hosting an incubator. That could be committing to purchase some portion of their supply chain on the IT side from New Jersey startup companies. That could be uh, working with public schools or, or, or uh, post-secondary schools to, to uh, create interns and, and uh, you know, on-the-job training opportunities. And then we take that money and partner it with real venture capital investors. So we would say, you bring us a deal, Michelle, you bring us a deal, I want to invest in the next cure for cancer or the next dating app or some, you know, somewhere in between. Um, and we, you know, I'm ready to put my money into it. I'm a professional venture capitalist. We've underwritten it, we've vetted it. We think there's a real, uh, you know, there's a real there there. Will the state match that? Yes, with the condition that the company stay in New Jersey and be in New Jersey, be headquartered in New Jersey. And if we have you know, a handful or a decent handful of more of those bets, yeah, there's some risk involved in that. Uh, but there's risk involved in any tax credit or t any economic development uh, initiative. We think that's going to help create more of the companies that 5, 10, 15 years from now employ 1,000, 5,000, 10,000 people. And so that's a, that's a really important part of why the governor's so focused on that, because that's really how you get the engine of job creation going in a much more sustainable and durable and, and, and scaled kind of way. Well, if you stay on investment for a moment. Sure. Um, so NJBIA was, was very uh, proud of our part in trying to advance the science, innovation, and technology. Yeah. Commission, uh, which is now back up and running, um, and they announced back in September, you know, funding. Yep. Can you give us a status on that, um, and and what can we expect from that, and when we can expect some activity there? Yeah, the Commission on on, um, uh, on Science, Innovation, and Technology was uh, something I think the governor was very proud to sign that bill, and a number of people in the legislature and the BIA and a number of other groups uh, worked really hard on it. You know, Assemblyman Zwicker, I thought his size his team here before, but I think she might have left, uh, you know, has been a champion of this, as well as uh, Assemblyman De Phillips and Senator Singer and Senator Sala, who I all now serve on the, on the board of the, uh, on the commission, along with me and a number of the other state commissioners and uh, a number of private sector and academic leaders. It's a really great group. Um, yeah, they, the, um, one of the sad parts about the commission going away whenever it went away was that it, uh, it was a source of matching funds for federal research grants, which are huge. Um, uh, sources of input or sources of early early stage funding, particularly for um, academic research that has an opportunity to be commercialized, and it's partnerships between usually smaller companies and sometimes bigger companies, but usually smaller companies with a professor or a grad student at one of our universities to to make some to do some early stage research that might turn into again the next big thing. I don't know what that next big thing is, but uh, and so the, the the commission just in September October approved uh, about a half a million dollars of funding to be matched. Uh, to be essentially leverage uh, on those federal grants. You have to have a, a local match for that federal funding. Um, it's uh, it's going to be $125,000 is technical assistance to help people write their grants and write their applications, and then uh, $375,000 of funding uh, to be awarded as grants to those, uh, again, most likely uh, university-based research uh, researchers uh, to advance that work. It's something a lot of other states do. Uh, kind of a lot of people talk about what are other states doing. This is, a, this is something that New Jersey was doing, like lots of other places, and stopped. Um, I'm really thrilled we're bringing that back. And I think we'll be taking app that commission, which I'm only just a, a member of, but we're working very closely with them. Uh, we'll be taking applications early in the new year for how to get that rock and roll, which we're really excited about. Sure, that's great. And we talk about um, the fact that we have a highly talented workforce here in the state of New Jersey, Jersey and the number one K-12 um, in the nation, which we're very proud of. On any given year, we, we vie with um, you know, Maine, not Maine, I'm sorry, um, Massachusetts, Massachusetts on is that. The, is the, um, you know, and, Sox, you know, we, we can talk about the cost in each state another time that they do it at half our cost, but that's not for our discussion today. But when we talk about our talent yeah. um, and keeping that talent, because, you know, we are the number one out migration state of that talent uh, in, in the nation right now. In addition to the focus on, on research grants, mm -hmm. et cetera, what else can we do um, in order to ensure our future pipeline stays sure. here? And what would your role and EDA's role be in that as well? Well, I wish I had a magic wand. I could solve the problem. That'd be yeah, great. Yeah, we both uh, do. <laughs> uh, look, at, at, first of all, I think the out-migration story is, is different depending on where you look and, and which data you look at. Uh, and it's, it tends to migrate by, there's, there's kind of several stories of the, migrate, of the in and out migration. First of all, we, t we continue to be a place where people from outside America, mm -hmm. yeah. this is a destination of choice, and one of the reasons we're so focused on having sensible immigration policy is that folks from all over the world uh, still call, want to call New Jersey home. We were in, the governor and a big team of us were in India, it feels like, a year and a half ago, it was three months ago. Uh, we have the largest concentration of uh, people of Indian origin in the world, in, in the United States. That that's a, continues to be a huge talent pipeline in from overseas. That's one of a dozen places that continues to be a great sender of, of talent here. So that's important, an important piece of the story. The population overall is still growing, not as fast as we'd like it, but the uh, the in and out migration story is a bit more nuanced than we're losing lots of people. Um, 
we, we do tend to lose people in that sort of 18 to 30 cohort mm -hmm. in a big way. And then they do what I did, which was I got a job in New Jersey in my 30s and moved home and bought a house and my kids are being raised here because the schools are great and it's a wonderful place to live and you can get good pizza and bagels and it's great. Um, that, that, that part of the pizza story. Pizza and bagels are very important. It's all pizza in the water, New Jersey important. water. <laughs> I, I think that's, and we pump the gas for you. It's very exciting. That's right. Um, <laughs> You know, what we have to do is make more uh, of a focused targeted investment on how you can attract, keep, attract and retain more folks in that 18, to, you know, between where they choose to go to college and then what they, where they choose to go after college. Uh, those are two separate and discrete decision points that both need, um, both need to be thought through. On the sort of post-college side, you know, I think, again, we do better than we think we do. New Jer uh, Jersey City has the highest concentration of millennials per capita of any, city, of any city of size in America. We'd like to have that more spread out across the entire state, uh, but it is one of the most millennial dense um, uh, you know, cities anywhere in, the, in America. Um, part of the story, when you look at places like Massachusetts, and we talked about a lot with Pennsylvania, was talked about in the prior discussion, um, we, and I do this myself, excuse me, I'm guilty of this myself, I work for the state, I tend to think in states, but really it's about metro areas and cities. If you took Pennsylvania, if you took Philly out of Pennsylvania, if you took Boston out of Massachusetts, if you took New York out of New York State, the more suburban, less spread out, smaller city-centric parts of the, of the Northeast are not doing as well as the big cities. And we, you know, our biggest city is 250,000 people and, and that's, that's both an opportunity and a challenge. We've got to strengthen and make investments in you know, everywhere from you know, Newark and Jersey City and Patterson and Camden and Trenton and, and some of the smaller cities that surround them. That's a really important part of that, of that dynamism that young talent is Absolutely. looking for. Mm -hmm. The number of times we've had conversations with companies, big companies run by folks who are you know, a generation older than me who are not the people we're talking about making one in this vibrancy, they, they know their talent wants it. You know, big, big companies are struggling with how do we get more of our people from Hoboken and New Jersey City to come out to where we are on a, as a transit matter. It's a big challenge. Um, and, and the number of conversations that we have where, where folks say, this isn't where we, this office space that we're in today isn't probably where we need to be 10, 15 years from now because it's not, it doesn't have the dynamism and the vibrancy. They'd like to be in a city. They'd like to be uh, with more walkability. They'd like to have more of their folks, you know, uh, walk to work or bike to work. And that's because that's what their talent wants. Uh, and so we've got to make big investments in our cities and do that in a way that doesn't displace the folks that have fought and stayed through, through challenging times in those cities and uh, those urban communities. That's a really important part of how we're thinking about building you know, the most we want. Everyone wants to have an innovation economy. We want to have the most diverse and inclusive innovation economy because that's who we are as a state, who we are as a people, uh, and so that's that's a really important part of it. But so I think things like investing in brownfields, converting more of our legacy industrial properties in our cities into productive parts of the economy again, really important. Uh, enacting an historic tax credit. Uh, sorry. Uh, Historic preservation tax credit. I hope it would be historic in its, in, in its import, but it would be a historic preservation uh, tax credit. We're one of uh, 11 states around the country that doesn't have a state level historic tax credit, uh, historic preservation tax credit. That's why when you go to places like Patterson and Camden and lots of places in between, there's these beautiful old buildings that with a little bit more love and a little bit more money could be you know, the home of the innovation economy uh, and, or could be the home, the, the actual homes. It could be condos and, and, and apartments but they need a little extra love, a little extra investment. That's a really important part of the governor's uh, proposal, which uh, from my perspective, I, I think the, con the conversations with the legislative, uh, legislation, legislature and legislative leadership have been constructive and we've made progress, obviously not done, as we heard earlier, um, uh, but certainly good progress has been made there and I'm optimistic that something so you, constructive you, can happen there. So we talk about uh, innovation economy, but you, you a moment ago used the express term, the most diverse innovation economy. Yeah. And we're the most diverse state in the nation, and uh, we talk about the, the inflow from out of the country as well. And we know that the types of jobs in the innovation economy um, have diverse workforce, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So what are we doing, and in particular, what's the administration doing relative to driving and supporting that diversity for the future to ensure the diverse innovation economy? Yeah, it's something we're spending a lot of time, and I, I don't represent that we have all the answers and have figured this out, because a lot of smart people, much smarter than me, uh, are thinking about this around the country, around how do you get more uh, women and people of color in the C-suite and the founders, the founders organization, you know, the founders club of the, uh, of, the, of the companies that are being founded in the innovation economy, and then filling out the entire workforce and service on those boards. Um, the, the First Lady hosted an event uh, six or seven weeks ago at Drumthwacket to launch the New Jersey chapter of a group called Golden Seeds. Golden Seeds is a great national organization that is focused uh, on, uh, particularly on the, on the women, uh, women founded, women led uh, startup companies, trying to get more ca venture capital into those into those companies. New Jersey has uh, it's an angel invest, uh, investor group that makes early stage investments. New Jersey will be the seventh chapter along with places like Northern California, New York, 
uh, somewhere in the Midwest, I forget, uh, and Boston, uh, and one down south, Atlanta. Uh, and so we're excited about that. That is one thing we're doing. Uh, we had a great roundtable discussion a couple weeks ago in Newark at Rutgers, around, particularly around communities of color. The, the statistics on uh, venture capital that have gone to firms founded by people of color are depressing. And, and unacceptable. There's even more so if you layer in women of color. It's like virtually infinitesimally small amounts of venture capital, uh, both in New Jersey and across the country. Um, so we're thinking pretty hard about how we can be more purposeful around uh, trying to get more um, more capital into the in, into companies that are that are that have a diverse uh, founders group. We're doing that also from a policy perspective. So the angel investor tax credit uh, in three weeks becomes the most potent tool, uh, most potent angel investor tax credit in America. Governor signed a bill that a number of people worked on. The biotech task force uh, was, was instrumental in, in, in getting this passed. Uh, doubles the angel investor tax credit from 10 to 20 percent. Then there's a there's a, a bonus in there if you invest either in a company that's uh, uh, located in an opportunity zone or that has a diverse founders group. Um, you get a, another 5 percent bonus. So it's a 25 percent. Uh, tax credit, refundable tax credit. So you're making an angel investment in a young company, you're getting a 25% de-risking of your capital on day one. Even if you don't have a New Jersey tax liability, it's a refundable credit. You get a check in the mail that you can deposit in any bank in, in the world um, that de-risks your investment by 25% on day one. Um, it's really important, but again, there's a diversity bonus built mm -hmm. into that. Uh, we also just changed our criteria. New Jersey, uh, the EDA, from time to time, will make direct investments in venture capital funds as a, as a limited partner, uh, relatively small dollars compared to what we want to be doing on the Evergreen Fund. But uh, we've now added uh, additional criteria where we're trying to prioritize and, and encourage the folks that we invest in at the fund manager level um, to be having you know, more, a, a, more, a bigger diverse group around their, their investment decision table and also about where they're investing and with, into whom they're investing. So it, that's, that's a... That's a long journey, but if you're not purposeful about starting it, you'll never get there. So we're, we're, we're working like hell on that. So when we talk about innovation, there's certainly the innovation economy and, and jobs that are all around innovation, but we're looking across the room here where we have a lot of small, mid-sized business. Um, they think of innovation within their own companies, number one, and then also, you know, how do, they, how do they get a part of this? Because if we're putting all our attention over here on an innovation economy, I have folks sitting out here saying, well, hey, you know, what about me? What's in it for me? So can you share, you know, for the businesses who are um, either you know supporting supply chains to that or consumers of that or how in their own company they can benefit from innovative initiatives across the state sure uh, yeah and at first I, I, I think the distinction between kind of and I, I even did it I'm guilty of this I did it 15 minutes ago between the innovation economy and not the innovation economy I think it's kind of a false dichotomy right. any business that's not feeling the disruptive uh, impulse uh, the disruptive effect of, of things like digitization and automation I'd be surprised if anyone in this room wasn't thinking about that in their in their business day to day some are doing the disruption some are being disrupted but that's the the, the, the the, the to and fro is happening really everywhere, um, and, and so I think again I think it's about it's not about one or the other. Um, we've we've stepped up a number of uh, excuse me, stood up a number of tools and programs um, around small business lending, uh, trying to provide more capital uh, into the small business part of the economy, and also having a much more purposeful and uh, um, specific engagement with uh, industries that are focused, for example, on things like advanced manufacturing. Now again, advanced manufacturing is pretty innovation centric, right? But it's also pretty traditional, mm -hmm. so it's a place where it's kind of both things come together at the same time. Um, I was really, we got an award a couple uh, on Manufacturing Day from, from John Kennedy's group and said it was the first time that EDA had been really engaging with them in a meaningful way in a long time. That wasn't hard for us to do. It was just a decision we took to, to sort of be more engaged at sort of a more of a sector level than just an, than a company level. So how can we do more things around talent um, uh, in, those, in those sectors that have traditionally not been as focused, that the folks like the EDA have not focused on as much on the talent side. So we did a pilot program with the Ocean County uh, Vocational and Technical School System to uh, create awareness for the young folks that are in, I guess, mostly high school, maybe earlier than high school as well. That there's a ton of jobs out there that are good paying, that pay good benefits, that uh, are companies that you know you might not have, uh, you might not be household names, but are in your area and in your region that are, uh, you know, good paying jobs with with good wages and good benefits right in your backyard. And so we partnered with a bunch of. Um, uh, you know, four or five relatively large uh, sort of mid-sized employers in Ocean County and over into, into Burlington County to do a, basically a field trip. We, we paid, the, the, the EDA's big innovation here, we paid for the buses. Um, <laughs> the school system was nice enough to corral the kids and get them on the buses and the companies were nice enough to host them um, to say, look, young people, guys, gals, everybody, there's tons of great jobs here. This, by the way, this company's workforce is probably aging. There are going to be a lot of opportunities here. Absolutely. Study hard, work hard. This is a real path to opportunity for you. Uh, we're hoping to scale that 
uh, across lots of other places, because Ocean County is only one of 21 places you want to do. Uh, but a, a, a good example of relatively small dollars, it was like $10,000 to buy buses for a couple of days, um, uh, relatively small in, in, in interventions to try and create a, a bigger impact. The other place I'd mentioned that you talked about supply chain, uh, Michelle, which is really important. Um, things like offshore wind and clean energy mm -hmm. right, are, are hyper innovation centric. It's creating energy from the sky. I don't know how you do that, that without innovation in R&D. Um, but there's going to be huge opportunities all throughout the supply chain from folks that may have been involved in more traditional, for lack of a better word, you know, uh, component manufacturing or, or, or you know, making nuts and bolts and widgets for other industries that are going to have tons of opportunity uh, in that supply chain around offshore wind. So we, again, trying to do things a little bit differently and a little bit more broadly than, than just tax incentives, we've done things like set up an offshore wind supply chain registry. There's lots of great big companies there, mostly Northern European, that are literally washing up on shore saying, hey, how do we build offshore wind farms here in New Jersey? Who do, we, who do you call? How do we get these folks, you know, how do we build a supply chain? What better role is there for the government to play in that scenario than just creating that marketplace? Say, hey, you know, New Jersey manufacturers, New Jersey uh, services companies that want to be in on this, Let's do a little matchmaking. It's not. It's a website. It's not. Again, this is not billions of dollars of investment, but it creates those opportunities that we think are going to uh, really catalyze long-term growth there. So, you know, and, and, and right in that space, what, what's interesting? I don't, I don't know how many manufacturers we have in the room today, but just I'll use as an example. We know that um, a lot of the processes that exist today could be tweaked just a little bit in order mm -hmm. to make um, a new widget to go into an offshore wind turbine versus it was going into um, some type of other aerospace or defense component before. Right. Yeah. And so the opportunity to create in, um, not just investment opportunity but um, incentive programs also to get money into those companies to change those processes. Can we expect to see something like that? You know, can a manufacturer say, hey, if I had you know X money to invest in shifting around my machinery, um, I could be able to feed that supply chain? Yeah, two pieces of that. Great question. Thank you for, for asking it. But for, if, if we actually Asked that, then it was a good job by our staff. It's a great question. Thank you. I made it up. Okay, it's a good one. Of course, you would. Of course you did. Um, we are on the. We have an RFP either on the street or going out very soon uh, for some technical assistance because exactly the phenomenon you described, Michelle. There's a number of companies that have. You know, I'm not an engineer. I'm not a scientist. Um, uh, by any stretch of the imagination, um, the tolerances you need to do to, that you need to build into the, the components that go into an, a piece of equipment that's going to be 20 miles offshore and 300 feet in the air are very different than something that goes into a you know a piece of equipment that's much more easily maintained. And so the the, the tolerances and the, te and the technical capabilities you need to have as a supplier are the, the you know the game your game probably needs to be upped a little bit. So we're going to be hiring or we're going to contract with a. a, a technical assistance provider that's going to work with companies directly and say, you're here, here's what up here looks like, and here's how you get from here to there. And then we're also going to provide some financing tools so they can actually make the capital equipment uh, investments, to, because it's not just know-how and, and process, although some of it's know-how and process, but some of it's going to be about you know, um, you know, capital equipment uh, upgrades and providing some low-cost financing to do that, because it's we, really We important. look forward to hosting some of those roundtables yeah. as that gets up and going. Um, our business outlook survey this year shows that... Um, I read about that. New, yeah, <laughs> yes, New Jersey's trajectory uh, on a look forward doesn't look like it's continuing in the upward and there's a lot of skepticism as we go into 2020. And it's great to talk about innovation ecosystem and, and job creation, et cetera, um, but a business climate has to be conducive to doing that. Uh, what can we expect or see um, in terms of some of these challenges around cost of doing business and tax rates uh, that can help to continue to stimulate job growth versus see that trajectory go in the opposite direction? Yeah, so I, I think um, I, 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 it's hard to entangle people's attitudes about New Jersey's business climate from the national business climate when there's so much volatility at the national level is part of, I don't, I'm not saying that to be a, first of all, it's not a political comment necessarily, it's just it's, we live as part of a national economy, part of a global economy, and there are, we, you know, we've been in, in, a, in a growth cycle, not as fast as anyone would like, but nationwide we've been in a growth cycle for going on 10 years, and that's a very long expansion cycle, so I think people are correctly presuming that at some point there's going to be a correction. Um, Look, I, I think the competitiveness, I think the challenge has been, and I think the, 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 the reason we're so focused and Governor Murphy is so focused on having a, a set of tools in our toolkit to make the right investments going forward is that we have lagged the rest of the country um, during a period of relative growth and we're going to be behind a little bit as we head into whatever the next phase is. And so whether that's investments in things like New Jersey Transit, investments in higher education, some of those big, those big picture uh, things, or things like new incentives to make sure that we are uh, uh, 
uh, prepared and ready for whatever comes next is an important piece of it because we, we recognize again the, the debate isn't should there be incentives or not incentives. The debate in, our, in the governor's perspective and, and my perspective, I 100% agree with him on, is we got to have the right incentives. They got to be calibrated and targeted and, and, and effective. Um, you know, we were 42nd in the country in job creation from 2007 to 17. 42nd. We we're 49th in wage growth. Wage growth declined in the state from 2007 to 17. So this is not an, an overnight phenomenon. Um, and that's, you know, in some ways a, a bill coming due for decades of, of challenges sure, and, and sure. investment decisions that I would have made differently with hindsight. Um, and so, you know, I think, you know, obviously we're focused on uh, trying to create a, uh, an environment that is conducive to small business. We, you know, but we think, you know, we think the, the path out of here or the path out of this conundrum is to grow and to grow at a better rate than we've been doing, to grow faster than our peers. That's going to require investment today that doesn't gener necessarily generate a return today, um, but in things like infrastructure, higher ed, talent, and again, having a smart set of tools to invest in in growth, uh, and also keeping our eye on the, on the, on the regulatory side of the equation. There are times, you, you, this is a, this is like a, uh, Heter this is a heterodoxy or heretic talk in a, in a business group. There's sometimes regulations can be used to our advantage. One of them is sports betting, for example. Sports betting is um, booming um, and, and on a bipartisan basis, lots of governors and lots of uh, legislative leaders pushed to get that Supreme Court case decided the right way uh, or to get advanced so that there could be sports betting in New Jersey. Um, but the way those regulations have been written, the way that the Division of Gaming Enforcement has been working with industry in a way that's protecting consumers, protecting uh, the public, uh, the public trust, and all these things, but also encouraging, um, encouraging companies to come here, cut their teeth here, and be the national model. Because we have a bit of a head start, because New York hasn't legalized yet, and some of the other states haven't legalized in as in as thoughtful a way as we have uh, around sports betting. We have a regulatory incentive, for lack of a better word. Mm -hmm. uh, doesn't happen every day. That's, I'm not suggesting that, that is the panacea coming to every industry soon. I'm not. Not naive, but um, but I think you know there there are ways we can be smart and thoughtful about how we use regulation uh, to encourage uh, innovation, encourage job creation. Great, thank you. Um, do we have a question or two from the audience as we wrap up? I see we have a question front and center. Hey Tim, George Toji from KPMJ. How are you doing? Okay. You know we're hearing a lot about the issues and problems with New Jersey. There are opportunities. And first of all, the the innovation development projects, plans are, are phenomenal. You have to grow it from the ground up. But New Jersey over its history grew tremendously because it was able to attract the companies from New York, Philadelphia, that were growing largely. The cost structure got out of whack. And you know, right now, companies are paying $100 a square foot on Canal Street for tech space. At if, some time, if they're, those, good, if they're good at negotiating with their real estate person. Right. Yeah, that's, at some times, point, those entrepreneurs are going to grow, they're growing up, they're going to have three kids, they're going to want great schools, they're going to want all the things that their predecessors wanted. But some of what you're seeing right now is that they're making those moves to Raleigh, to Atlanta, to Salt Lake City, to Austin with the operations or the next phases of their projects. What can be done? What can the state and EDA do to kind of capture the attention back that New Jersey's a, 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 a a place that you can kind of, you know, it's the it's the competitive place for the next for the next phase of operations. Mm -hmm. there are a couple of different questions embedded there, and I'll, I'll answer the ones that are easier to answer. Um, look, I think first of all, I think the fundamental trend you described around the sort of this, the New York and Philly dynamic is is 100% right. No state benefited. Some combination of New York and, and Connecticut, no state benefited more from the challenges that places like New York City and Philadelphia went through in the 70s and 80s, more so than New Jersey and Connecticut. That wind, that, that, the, the tailwind that we had from that, you know, kind of crime rate, quality of life uh, decline that happened from 1965 to 1995, call it, uh, in New York in particular, and Philly to a certain extent as well, that trade is reversed. New York's doing really well. It has challenges coming out of its ears, but it's doing really well. So is Philadelphia. And so that, that, that pressure and that, the, the, if you think about sort of a two-way valve, the pressure is pulling back in the other direction now. And I worry more about, I worry just as much about losing folks to, to go back to, to sort of repay, to go back to New York or move operations to New York as I do to, the, to, to Raleigh and Austin and places like that. But I worry about both. It's, it's sometimes uh, it, juggling different anxieties when you have a job like I have the privilege to have um, because you're worried about lots of different competitors. Um, again, I think, I think it's about vibrancy and I think it's about talent. So part of it's about protecting what we have. So if you think about pharma and life sciences and I think about biotech in New York City and then eventually thinking about places like Raleigh or Austin, 
those places are building a talent base for sure, but it's nothing like the density of the talent base we have in, uh, in, in pharmaceutical, in the various disciplines that contribute to the pharma industry. If we lose that competitive advantage, we let other people in on that in too big a way, watch out. Part of that is about giving those folks who are coming out of school with degrees in chemistry and biology and uh, you know, the various disciplines that go into the pharma industry and drug discovery and, and uh, medical devices, they, they, they probably don't, and Assemblyman Greenwald, Leader Greenwald talked about this earlier too, they, they probably don't want to buy a house in the suburbs when, in their late 20s yet. They want, to, they want to defer that a little bit. They want to live in an apartment. They want to, they want a different lifestyle than uh, certainly my parents did and to a certain extent that, that I do. Um, and we've got to create those options the, the, and the, those choices. Uh, and then, and that's only part of the equation. I think those are two big parts of it. We have time for one more question. Uh, hello. Oh, he's already standing. He's already yeah. the question guy. <laughs> oh, there we go. Also, thank you, Michelle. <laughs> Alan Zakin, uh, Alan Zakin Associates, uh, PR Government Affairs uh, firm. And I chair the uh, ELC with uh, BIA for Morris County. Uh, there, um, there are approximately, uh, you mentioned manufacturing in uh, NJMEP, and they say there's about 30 to 40,000 STEM and manufacturing jobs out there uh, that are unfilled because they can't find qualified workers. There's uh, fortunately uh, funding that's going to be coming available through the Bonding Act for community colleges and Votex, and how can we focus that training to make sure that that training uh, helps fill those uh, job openings? Yeah, great question. And, and Lots of jobs that are going unfilled is a, is a high class challenge because uh, it means companies are growing and hiring. Uh, but it's a real challenge for the folks who, there's a ton of folks who are locked out of those jobs because uh, they don't have the skills they need. Uh, and those disproportionately, by the way, affect communities of, of color and women. Uh, and so we, one of the things that I'm, I'm proudest of being a part of the administration is, again, thinking about this comprehensively is that Workforce development is economic development. Those are two sides of the same coin. Rob Angelo and I talk all the time. Our teams work in great partnership with each other because the work on things like apprenticeship um, is, is, is extremely important uh, because to be able to get a job that is not an entry level job, but it's sort of a, a lot of those 30 to 40,000 jobs that, that, that MEP has been talking about are not right out of college, right out of, uh, right out of a training program jobs, they're, they're kind of second jobs. Uh, and so because we, we haven't been filling that pipeline enough. Uh, the, the, that's why that gap is, is, is presenting itself there. So getting into having more diversified apprenticeship programs that are, uh, again, the, the apprenticeship programs that have traditionally worked in things like the building trades are fantastic. Broadening that to more industries is really important. Um, and so that's something we're deeply committed to. I think the administration has, um, if I didn't get this exactly right, don't, don't tell Rob Angel. I think it's up 40%, the number of apprenticeship seats in the last two years, the number of apprenticeship seats is up 40% from a pretty big number to begin with, but it's up 40%. Yeah, it continues to grow each year. Our, our, our survey plays that out as Yeah, well. and that's an important piece of it. Uh, and, and, and then it's also, you know, things like P-TECH and, tr and trying to connect the traditional the, the school system, the, the, the K-12 system with job opportunities directly and with big companies that are doing, that are going to make those investments in those training. So it's, 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 it's an incredibly important, your question's 100%. Spot on in terms of things we really need to focus on is how do you how do you connect the talent we have that needs a little bit of a boost to get into the jobs that are available, um, and also uh, do the training that we need to do at the same time. Great. Well, I want to take the opportunity to thank Tim Sullivan for joining us today in our discussion. Let's have a round of applause. Thanks for having me.